to get it, not to let Robertson have a sight of the goal. Because if he does, it's, uh, it's normally lands him in the back of your net. He's probably the best finisher I've ever played with. And I was fortunate to play with Kenny Nugleaf, Joe Jordan, Derek Johnson, people of that quality. He just need to knock the ball up and push it a danger area. And he, if he said he can be quiet for eight or nine minutes, about that minute, he's in the park. And the minute he's not before it, he's liable, liable to stick the ball in the back of the net. Robertson helps it on. There's Robertson. Brilliant goal for Robertson. He's, he's lazy. He's a lazy player, but I think that goes for him because the last sort of 20 minutes when you're running about and you're struggling a wee bit because you've, you've put it in early doors, Robbo's a wee bit quicker than you because he's trying to walk to wait for the whole game. John Robertson to break the league goal-scoring record. Robertson, shot! Last season, John Robertson became the greatest striker ever to play for Heart of Midlothian when he broke the record held for 41 years by Jambo legend Jimmy Wardhall of 208 league goals. John has been a loyal servant to Hearts for 17 years. However, the story could have been very different. I'd been training Easter Road Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, uh, Thursday for three years under Jimmy Root, but fell off uh, John Fraser, Stan Vincent, and they offered me signing terms, and when my father had died, I decided I was going to stay in Edinburgh, so it was down to Hearts or Hibs. And Hearts, to their credit, they all said, look, we know there's our teams, and said, if you want to sign for us, just give us a phone and we'll, we'll sort something out. But I went down Easter Road, and uh, Tom Hart, the chairman, was there, Reddy Turnbull, and Jimmy Root, and, you know, he found out my brother Chris was playing for Rangers at the time, and then kind of panicked a bit and says, no, well, you either sign now or you don't sign for Hibs again. And we'd done the deal, we'd, we'd agreed the terms, I just wanted to run it past Chris to make sure that everything was okay, and that uh, he felt that it was right, and Tom Hart wouldn't have us. He says, no, you either, you either sign now or you never bear a Hibs trip again. And so I decided at that time that, obviously if that was the attitude that the chairman was taking, that I wouldn't sign. When John was only 14, his father died. He naturally turned to his older brother Chris for advice, and he was instrumental in bringing John to Hearts. I was actually here at the time uh, with Hearts for two or three seasons, and John had a chance to go to one or two clubs uh, down south, and Hibs were also interested in him. Um, uh, but, no, I, I was a Hearts fan, and I knew John wasn't a bad player, so uh, I kind of encouraged him to come on to the Hearts and uh, eventually took my place and uh, <laughs> uh, I didn't have any uh, career after that with Hearts. I'm only kidding off. Once I became professional, 16, it was a wee bit rare because Chris made my life hell for two years being the ground staff boy. I had to clean his boots, I had to wash his kit, I had to go for his lunch and I would come back with Chris's lunch and John Bruff would send me up for his lunch. And I'd come back with John's lunch and what a kid would be went and send me up again and they made my life hell at the time but to be fair they did look after me. John has a remarkable goal record against Hibs. In the early years, his performance may have been spurred on by his rejection at the hands of the Easter Road side. John Cahoon now with the corner. He's been charging in with a chance. John Robertson! I think it did in the early years. I don't think there's any doubt about that, that um, I went out there with the attitude that I'm going to show them what they've missed and um, the annoyance. Uh, perhaps want to say something. Not, not quite a feeling of rejection. Probably a let, you know, it was maybe a let down in the end. And I thought, well, right, okay, this is it. I'm going to go out there and show what you could have had.
ball through for Foster. He's got Robertson in the middle. Good Robertson! What a goal by Hart! Oh, that was magnificent play. It's a bit too in a way in the first game, but being realistic, I think I really can remember when I was maybe about 10 or 11, and he, he was banging the goals in every week. And obviously, he was a, a hero of mine, and a, a few of the boys who used to go to the game with but uh, what I can always remember him with is when he's sc scoring against Tibbs, and we always seem to score against him. And I think he gave himself and family and friends a, a lot of good pleasure every time he scored against him. Myself and Alec McDonald were basically at Hearts when he first started to come into the first team, uh, and we played a certain way. Uh, he was very fortunate in his early career to play with some very good, experienced strikers. Jimmy Bone, Jimmy Bone helped him immensely, and then Sandy Clark, and he developed through that. Uh, and I think the Hearts have helped him uh, to actually develop as a player by using big strikers that can maybe take uh, some of the pressure off him uh, and make basically use John to uh, the best of his ability. I've played alongside a lot of good players, scored goals alongside a lot of them. I think the most successful partnership was undoubtedly with Sandy Clark and John Cahoon. Um, the three of us really gelled superbly with John Cahoon's pace and ability to score goals as well from the wing. Sandy Clark's physical presence and again his ability to score goals. I lived with myself with the goals and um, it was quite a lethal partnership at that time and, and took us very close to winning the, uh, the league title in, in 86. In fairness, I've also had good partnerships with Derek O'Connor, Jimmy Bone. Um, two similar types of players, uh, very aggressive, good touches well and good finishers. There's Scott Crabb, who's very similar to myself, very skillful player, great finisher, terrific uh, free kick expert as well. And probably the one guy who I really have liked to have stayed at the club um, and kept going is probably the fact that he's more my kind of prodigy more than anything else. And he'd come through the ranks and I'd passed on a lot to him and I'd liked him, him to stay, but I've just kept going. At the end of the day, it's that's what I'm there for. I've been the mainstay scoring the goals and I've managed to fit in with a few partners and they all deserve their place alongside as well because I need their strengths as much as, as they need mine and that's the most important thing is to, to understand your strike partners, your, his strong points, his weak points and, and work hard together and, and over the years I've done that with a few. John's early years at Tynecastle have already been well documented and his insatiable appetite for goals led to fans and players alike asking if he could become one of the Hearts' all-time greats. The process began in season 89-90 when he broke Alfie Conn's record of 121 league goals. The legendary Willie Ball's record of 183 league goals had stood for over 30 years. And most importantly, Jimmy Wardhaw had scored an incredible 206 league goals in the 1940s and 50s. It was the record that everyone at the club wanted John to break. However, records were forgotten in season 1994-95 when poor performances in the league meant that the Tynecastle men faced the prospect of a relegation playoff in the last game of the season. It was one of the most important matches in John's career. But we had to win the match to avoid playoffs. And I scored a penalty. Uh, nothing too unique about it. It was just a straightforward penalty. But the, the significance of it was the club didn't have to go into the relegation playoffs. But that would drive to the inside, possibly uh, the two goals I scored at Dumbarton, which helped the club come up in promotion. They are the important ones. You don't want to be involved staying down in the first division. You don't want to go down in the first division. And although there was, you know, they weren't the great goals, they were very, very important for the sake of the club. The league record that season meant there would have to be changes, and Tommy McLean left Tynecastle to be replaced by the former Hearts captain, Jim Jeffries. The Jim Jeffries brought uh, a sense of Hearts back to Hearts. You know, there's no doubt in the past he was a, a captain and a, a long-serving player for 9, 10, 11 years, and he brought back a real sense of spirit into the club again that... Um, Hadn't been lacking in previous years, but we'd sort of gone away from the, the Hearts traditional side of things. We'd brought in different managers, tried different things, and we learned a lot, and each one of them was successful in their own way. But I think what Jim Jeffries brought back was a, a sense of being, he's been associated with the club for so many years. The fans could associate with him. A lot of the fans had seen him play as a player, and he wanted to instill that kind of pride, you know, a real sense of pride in the club and in the players. 
There's been much speculation regarding the relationship between John and his manager. But as a professional, Jim Jeffries recognises the importance of John to his squad. The record speaks for itself. He's been here a long time and uh, you know, he's gained great experience. He's played under a few managers and uh, as I say, uh, you can't take his record away from fantastic goal scoring achievement. And uh, you know, he works away and he gives a wee bit of advice here, there and everywhere and that's invaluable to, to, to any club. For me, you know, he's going to finish chances and he knows that I like the more attacking style. I like to be well organised, but at the same time I like the players to go and express and, and play football and go at teams and create chances. And if we do that, uh, hopefully John Robertson will benefit as well as the team because uh, he's the one that can certainly finish them. A slight one there as they try to find Grant. Johnson steps in for Hearts. Now it's Miller. Looking for Robertson. It's away by Gary Smith. Only as far as Mackay. This is Johnson. Aberdeen players all round. Only gets it through to Robertson. It's off the post. It's Robertson. John Robertson makes it 2-0 to Hearts. And that's Hearts 60th Premier League goal against Aberdeen. It's John Robertson's 10th Premier League goal against Aberdeen. And the Don's defence all over the place. The pass back to the goalkeeper to come off him, off the post. And that was Robertson to finish off. Hearts 2, Aberdeen 0. When I was in number 21 team, John had just came in. And we had a really good batch of strikers at the time with uh, Charlie Nicholas, uh, Eric Black, Morris Johnson. And they were all round about, you know, at the time and um, we were having finishing practice and I can always remember it was with Jock Steen and I can always remember Jock Steen um, telling me that John Robertson was the best finisher at the lot of them you know and I can always that's something that's always stuck with me and I don't know if it's just been his uh, you know his closeness to the ground but he's got terrific timing and, uh, you always know with John Robertson if, it, if a chance does fall to him the tremendous strike of the ball and it's very rarely does he miss a target Bet looking for Hagen. Well, Hagen has it now from McLaren's headed clearance. That's good play from Mackay. Robertson's onside. Is Leach inside? There's Robertson. This is an excellent bit of play from Gary Mackay. Superb, the shuffling inside. Robertson timed that superbly. He was definitely onside. And the finish left Maxwell helpless. I think on a percentage of chances that John gets, it must be a high percentage that he does score. Um, I was in the heart side, so I can say this. There wasn't a lot of chances created, but um, if there's maybe two or three created, um, basically I always rather than get one. So he was, as I say, he's excellent fish, um, finisher. He's a good reader, definitely a good reader of the game. Um, and he is, for his, for his size, he's quite sharp. <laughs> um, and that, oh, that's what we had, obviously John has made his mark in the penalty box. Um, he doesn't need a lot, a lot of room to, to pull the trigger. And as I say, he does it quite well and he's a good striker of the ball. So anything from 18 yards in, um, normally hits the back of the net. I never did think he scored many goals against me. <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> no, he was always tricky. I don't think John was ever one of the strikers that would ever run away from you. But when you're in the penalty box, there's not that, there's not that much space, as you know. And in the six yard box, there's even less space. I think to be a good striker nowadays, you've got to sort of play on the shoulder of good defenders and uh, sort of just wait for chances to happen. But I mean, you've got to sort of play in between that sort of offside and not offside position. Where you're going to get there first, and any sort of knockdowns from the goalkeeper mistakes from the defenders and John's done that for a number of years now and it's uh, a big good lesson for any young strikers coming through to watch the way John plays. And the pass goes astray and that's an mistake for Celtic and pursued by Betts who recovers well. Levine to touch McKinley. 
Thomas. Well, on to the referee. It's Gary Mackay. Thomas is still in the ground. It's laid off now to Tosh McKinley. Jim Bet drives it through. And John Robertson sends the ball beyond Marshall. 42 minutes gone, and Hawks take the lead. Jim Bet having the effort at goal, and John Robertson was there to get the ball behind Gordon Marshall. Well, John Robertson has a tremendous scoring record against Celtic. It was Jim Bett driving it through, and Robertson with the touch, wrong putting the goalkeeper. And what a record this man has against Celtic. He's the top scorer in this fixture, and that's his 14th goal against Celtic. A crucial part of any club is the team spirit. John is fortunate in that at Tynecastle, the atmosphere has always been close between the squad, regardless of the individual's playing experience. We've always prided ourselves on, uh, on having a real family atmosphere. Aunt McDonald really instilled that. He, he wanted the players together, he wanted the players socialising together, he wanted the families in and around them. Jim Jeffries is the same, he wants everybody involved, he wants to keep things going, and he, he wants all the players mixing with the young players and passing them bits. There's always pranks going on, there's always wind up, wind ups going on, somebody's always taking the stick in the dressing room, the jokers are always there, I mean we've got Pinky and Perky at the moment, Jim Hamilton and Neil McCann, and it's an absolute nightmare, you don't know what they're up to one minute for the next, they're, you know, they're up to all the tricks in the, in the world and they think they're the only two that know them, they forget that some of the players there have actually forgotten more of the tricks than they, they'll ever know. These are the two jokers of the pack, Mr Hamilton Mr McCann. Quiet as a mouse. Probably mind you, after the performances of late, very, very quiet, the boys. But uh, Neil McCann is going to be the next million pound player from Hearts. Jim Hamilton is either a two He's million. Going to be drinking and driving. <laughs> Jim Hamilton, to, to coin a phrase from Tony Fitzpatrick, is either a two million pound player or a two quid player. <laughs> and I still get excited. The games, you, you come to games, you still get butterflies in the, in the tummy. There's no doubt about that. I've been doing it for 17 years, I don't know anything else, and sometimes you dread the day that obviously there's going to be a day when I have to leave Tynecastle. But as soon as you get into the dressing room amongst the lads, the banter starts, etc., that just disappears. You go on your job. It's the greatest job in the world as far as I'm concerned. Too. Here we go, into the new Tynecastle. You're just going to walk right in there, Calvin. <laughs> Right, we're going to get a wee treat here. One of the young lads oh, happens to be a very good dancer. Can we clear the floor, please? Despite being what is today classed as a senior player, John still has a very good relationship with the less experienced squad members. Right, we're just going to put him to the highest test here. Let's go, Mikey. This is going to be This is what happens here. We get. This is an initiation test for young Mikey. Give yourself a name. <laughs> I'm Michael Cameron. I'm just going to give you a little song. It's 911 Body Shaking. Let's go, boys. One, two. You got my body shaking. Sends a shiver to my soul. I didn't get no warning. You got me shaking to the bone. I've got my secret weapon. I'm going to get you all alone. Yeah, yeah. So let your body lose control. Bowl of light and cool it hit me hard and yeah yeah so let your body lose control. This is our ground staff lads. Staff actually supposed to be working, but as usual. As in every club in the world. And easy. And the boots done? Alright. Uh, that's what we've got next to say boy. What? She's there. Well done, Mickey boy. Thank you. Get a lot of captain. New boat, new name, okay? How you doing, Plumber? Club captain, youngest captain ever, 21-year-old, hopeless. And you need an actual foreign language for this man. You can understand the French, the German, the Italians. If you can understand Bonnie, like... Connect with Sisla. You've got a It's a uh, wee video for you, Pop. I just to make sure that you're all right. Legend. Bring on the high bees. <laughs> As you can see, the young boys have not done the boots. All the different pegs here. These are my little ones here. All the boys joke that these should be around the, the car mirrors, because they're so small. But uh, as you can see, they come in various sizes and makes and stuff. 
Obviously, you've got to do your, your duties as a ground staff, and I was on the boots for about a week. But the worst job I got landed with, because I was a bit cheeky when I was younger, I got put in the washing, which is next door. But uh, we've got past it now. Young boys these days, as you can see, easy job, nothing to do. Not like the good old days. It's been different class with myself, and I think any other young lads at the club would tell you that can, if you do need advice, uh, that Robbo was always there, him and Gary Mackay especially, because they were, like ourselves, they were local lads who came up through the, the youth ranks, and obviously they had players to look up to. Uh, but they were younger, and any time that we've had any problems or we feel that we needed advice for them, they were the two that you would go and see, and they were always first to sit you down and have a good chat with you for half an hour. So and the two of them have been been great with likes of Marcel and Big Paul and Alan and now it's Gary Neesmith and players like that. One legacy of being such a prolific scorer is being labelled a penalty box player. But fellow professionals recognise that he has a lot more to offer the game. Yeah, he's not just a penalty box player. I think over the years he's been known to link up well with the fellow strikers and midfielders. And he's certainly been known to create a lot of chances as well. But I think people recognise him as a penalty box obviously a striker, because of the number of goals he has scored throughout his career. But there's plenty of other parts to his game other than scoring goals. Well, he's awkward, as, as he, just for his sheer size. He, he backs in well, and he does hold the ball well. Robbo uh, is very, very skillful. People might not give him credit for that, but I haven't seen him in training in some games. His, touchings, his touches are great, uh, and he, he can beat men just, just as he would up his shoulder. And I think... He's, he's up there with the best at holding players off. Um, I don't know whether that's just his size or what. Uh, I don't know, run the waist, but he's, he's very, very good at hold, holding players off. When Robertson was there, just ahead of Goff, he managed to hold off the Rangers skipper and just touch the ball into the path of Neil McCann. He, he isn't just a penalty box player. He can join people up, he can take the ball in. As I say, he's got a very good football brain and he can spread the play and he can make goals as well. But he, he, his biggest strength is inside that box. When you're in management or you're playing with him, that's where you want him to be. In 1995, John's value in important games was proven yet again when Hearts, led out by his two sons, met Hibbs at Easter Road. The previous month, John had equaled Willie Ball's league record of 183 league goals. If Hibbs won, they would take second place in the Premier League, but John was again determined to spoil their party. I bet Logan, our sprint coach, seems to think that you know, the bigger the crowd, the better I react. It may well be true. I mean, he, he winds me up all the time, and unless there's more than 10,000 in the stadium, then I'm not going to go out and play. But I think the reason I've, I've done so well in, in the big matches is I've tried to, or I feel more relaxed in them, especially the derby games. And there's no big secret. I go out there and relax, and, you know, derby games tend to be tense and tight, and there's a lot of mistakes made. So if you can stay relaxed and wait for the mistakes to come along, then more often than not, you're going to get a chance. And, and that's all I've done. I've just, you know, work hard, wait for your chances, and when they come along, take them. Robertson trying to get the better of Hunter. He's been clear to held back there. The referee's allowing advantage. Hearts are getting players forward. This is Lawrence. Twisting and turning, trying to find the opening, and flipping that one over the top. Just uh, under five minutes of the first half there. No scoring, here come Hearts, so it's Robertson clipping it across. McPherson's there! And David McPherson scores for Hearts! Well, David McPherson looking at the far post and picking his spot beyond Jim Layton. Well, John Robertson, who's always such a thorn side, providing the cross, and David McPherson not picked up. 
Um, picking his spot. Great play here by John Robertson. He's worked and worked today. Not going to get much uh, service into his feet. He's worked ever so hard. And he puts in a great cross for Big Dave McPherson, who again has been playing particularly well. But Robertson a thorn in the hip side. Keith Wright, he does well under pressure. McGinley sends that one through. It's Gareth Evans. And then comes the substitute. And Graham Donald scores the equaliser for Hibernian. In the 60th minute, Hearts received a further blow. They were reduced to 10 men when Gary Mackay was sent off, and worse was to come. Put into the near post. It's away by Love. Hamilton's there to return it. It's love again for Hibbs. And it way down the Easter Road slope. Looks well played by Anil. That's what he's better at. And uh, Keith Wright is certainly on side. It's right. Taking on Winnie, teeing it up. And Pat McGinley scores for Hibernian. The game looked lost as it reached the 90th minute. But Hibbs still had the danger of Robertson to contend with. And it's deflected for the corner kick. The pressure remains on the Hibernian defence. Well, contend man Hearts pull off something dramatic here. Then comes a corner. Still not probably clear, but uh, Love gets it away eventually. And uh, Hibs are getting players forward now. That's a minute of stoppage time played as Nelson plays a high one forward. McPherson's still up there. Little stumble there by John Cahoon, he's showing persistence, he's got the free kick. So Hearts battling right to the end, and uh, some nerves starting to show among the Hibs players. Again, everyone's pushed forward. Well, when Robertson's inside the penalty area, and against the Bernie, anything's likely to happen. There's Robertson getting a little touch. Robertson trying to get in the shot! from John Robertson. He's done it again, and he's set a new record. That's his 23rd goal against the Bernian. And it's a new record for John Robertson. 184 league goals. He overtakes that other match great Willie Bald in the most dramatic circumstances here at Easter Road. Well, he's punished hips down through the years. He got in a little touch there with his head. The ball broke back to him. There didn't seem to be any way through, but then he found the opening. A tremendous goal by John Robertson. A happy moment for me was the, the last minute goal against Hibs at Easter Road because that meant I'd beaten Willie Ball's record, who was my dad's all-time hero. You know, he loved to call him Bald Motto, but Bald was his, his top man, he was his, his number one, and to beat them in such an important goal. And I uh, know my big brother George was, was sitting there with his green and white scarf on, would be a wee bit annoyed, made it a sweet moment. It's spirited performances like that which have made John such a threat to Hibs since his Hearts career began 17 years ago. John certainly got the Indian sign over Hibs, and whenever he goes in the park, and you can see the Hibs fans are sort of turning away, and he lets go. Robbo's in the park, he's going to score the winning goal. And it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling when I mean, you've got that against a certain team. You know they're going to play well, or you know you're going to score a certain amount of goals. <laughs> Steve Fulton now with this free kick. John Miller's a big threat. Very good near. Stephen Tweed did well. Poor clearance attempt by O'Neill. Lock. Penalty kick's given. Called by Mullen. Kenny Clark did no doubt. And John Robertson now has the chance. 
to continue his 100% record on the spot this season. He scored twice in two attempts. Goal of six for the season, and this would be his 24th derby goal, and that is a record. Well, when he holds the record with 23. So Robertson against Leighton, international teammates. Here comes Robertson. No answer to that. The power was too much for Leighton. He does give us a boost to know that he can score so many goals against them, and I think to a certain extent they must feel that when he's on the bench they're a wee bit at ease because their support I think I don't think many of their supporters will like him because I mean the goals that he scored against them over the years have been phenomenal. I think he definitely worries sides when he plays against them and Hibs I don't think are any different. Uh, I think they know his record is absolutely brilliant against them about scoring goals because he knows that he's going to be in there getting chances and I think Hibs more than more than any other team because of the record he has against them. Even if John was perhaps going through a, a dip in form, uh, when it comes to a match like Hibbs, he's going to be almost first on the team sheet because of that effect. When other teams see the name on the team sheet, they know they've got a game ahead. Well, I can remember the, the first, his first goal here when he came back to Newcastle was against it. He came off the bench and we won 2-1. Right to the far post, up goes Houchin! <laughs> the hearts deadly from these positions around the box with Ian Ferguson, the main threat. Bannon also deadly with these swerving free kicks. Five in the wall. Bannon leaves it. There's Ferguson. Now Bannon! There's Collins winning it back for his. Well, that's good play from Collins. Well, running into that ruck of players in maroon and losing possession eventually. There's Ferguson picking out McKinley on the left. Robertson calls to the ball in the middle, up he goes! There's Robertson! Nine minutes from the end! All fans go wild as John Robertson scores! His first goal at Time Castle since his return from New Castle. He scored that day, but only, I can only I can remind you that day was the worst haircut I've ever seen. And I think it was a crew cut. But every goal he scored against Hibs is, is, is brilliant, eh? Robertson! Lifeblood of every club is the fans, and at Tynecastle, the supporters are its heart. Naturally, John is a hero to many, but he's keenly aware of the contribution of the rest of the team. I think goal scorers are lucky in that respect. That if you can manage to get a reasonable haul of goals every season, you obviously be, it's easier to become a fan's favourite. There's no doubt about that. Um, there's times when you see the midfield boys who put in a power of work, the defenders who put in a power of work don't get anywhere near the amount of praise that they should get. Whereas a, a striker can have a terrible game and, and grab a, a winning goal late on and, and instantly become the fans' hero or become the fans' favourite. It is a lot easier that way, but 
you know, I hope it's not just my goals, but my general all round play uh, and enthusiasm that's helped win over the Hearts fans. And if they've enjoyed my career half as much as I have, then it's certainly all been worthwhile as far as I'm concerned. John Robertson, for me, is the best player I've seen with Hearts. I mean, the goals he scored, his track record against Hibs in the derby, I always had my wager on John Robertson to score the first goal against Hibs, whether it be at Tencastle or Easter Road. My wager was always on Robertson for the first goal, because he was the man to do it. Hogg getting up well. There's Robertson! <laughs> Typical finishing from Robertson. Hard to the head in just four minutes. Oh, he's going to be up there in a great in any of the Hearts great teams, like you know, like uh, to say that the 50s was a bit for my time. I've never seen Corn Bold and Watson, but certainly since then he's by far the best centre forward of the Hearts since the 50s, like, no doubt about it. When the players do realise that Robertson's playing as a heading for the manage for the manager of the opposition team to, to say, right, how are we going to cope with Robertson? Because he's always there to put the leg out and score the goal. Yeah, I'd, I would fear John Robertson in a, any team sheet. But it's almost as worth a goal as a start, perhaps, against the Hibs. They, they do tend to uh, panic when Robertson's playing for some reason. And man marking, they end up they tend to put two men on Robertson, which frees it for all the other players, you know. So we're in a no win situation when he's mentioned, I'm afraid to say. Again, no. It's down. Jackson. Again, Beckford's deep in his own half, gets it away. Here's McCann. Showing good pace again. The chance is on for Roberts, and he must score! Another milestone in the marvellous career of this little man. It's his 25th goal against Hibernian. It's his 250th goal for Hearts. He's absolutely delighted. We can never write you Rob off. He's always dangerous about the box. And he's popped up again. He's, he's, he's broken hearts again. Robertson trying to get in the shot. Oh, he's done it. It's unbelievable from John Robertson. And the Robertson dynasty may continue through his three sons, Mark, Liam and Scott. And more bad news for the opposition, his nephew Robbie can play a bit too. Robbie and Mark are not surprisingly Hearts fans, but when it comes to choosing their favourite players, Liam has his own ideas. Uh, my Uncle John. My dad and... I like the new signing, Adam. Uh, look. Low drop and gas clean. John's careful not to push the boys into a football career. Instead, he suggests targets they can aim for. He just tells us what to do and we keep on practicing and practicing. Like, when I was six, he told me to try and get 10 keepy uppies. But I couldn't and now I've got 46 as my record. And he, last night he told us, he, me and Rob, my cousin, Robbie here, um, told us to try and get 20 with left foot and right foot. And today I've done it twice, and Robbie done it once last night and once today. And my wee brother had to do ten left foot, right foot. And he's still not done it yet. I've got, got nine though. No. I've got eight. I've got nine. And ten. Youngest son Scott looks as though he may need an agent to advise him on his future career. Do you want to play goalie? No. Defender? No. Striker? No. Striker? Striker. Striker. No matter how hectic his football life becomes, John always dedicates his free time to his wife Tracy and his family. When you get him to golf, of course, that is I. <laughs> he likes his golf and his football, but the family as well. He's not one for going out, pubs, clubs and that. Not very often. He has his moments. Big Davies, he's the one that he disappears with, but um, I would say generally, yeah, the family orientated. But my dad was totally into the football, and the majority of the family are football, so 
something is, but I mean, I like the football. I think it'd be difficult if you were a footballer's wife that hated football, then you've got a, a problem. But the boys, you know, I encourage it. They're, the oldest one, Mark, he's more all round football, golf. I like sports, but no one to push any of them into football. I'd rather just, just took their own time, seeing what they've done themselves. However, football is never far away. Together, John and Tracy built a trophy room to commemorate John's long and distinguished football career. Well, here we are in the, the garage, so to speak, um, which my wife and I have transformed into a so-called trophy room. As most Harps fans will give me a stick, or other fans will give me a stick, because I've not actually won anything. But uh, you can see I've managed to get most of my international strips. The very first one I played for Scotland here was the centenary match, which is quite a big one. And I've swapped a few in the way. I'd, I was ordered by Gary Locke here to swap this one with him along. A um, couple of favourites, obviously being a boy with hero of mine, Ken Dalgleish. I uh, bought this at an auction for our sense testimonial. So to have a, a strip of obviously the King is uh, very important to me. It's a great one to have. And these probably mean more to me than anything. It's um, my first ever pair of football boots, which I think I wore from the age of about four to six. They probably actually still fit me now because I'm only a size five, five and a half, but uh, my mum kept a hold of these and passed them on um, to my brothers to pass on to me. So obviously a great sentimental value here, um, something that of all the things I would give away to people, these are probably the only things I would keep myself. And what we have here is um, something that I've kept throughout all the years with different uh, programmes and letters I actually received from clubs I was on trail with as a youngster, obviously Arsenal. Uh, making arrangements to come down the different letters. Uh, Blackpool, it's been a week down there. Celtic, uh, Leeds United, and Leicester, etc. All the way through. We send things up to Man City as well. And these are all the arrangements, different bits, not in the forest. So Brian Clough, obviously, uh, keeping an eye on the young players. And as a, a youngster, obviously, you're, you're delighted to receive these because it, it means you're getting there, obviously. Again, where's it going? But Mr. Robert Jenks, Bobby Jenks, who's now the community officer at Tin Castle of all places. This here is a, a very important thing as far as I'm concerned. In football, you've got to have certain mottos. And to me, this is one of the biggest, biggest mottos I've always based my game on. And it was sent to me by Ken Barnes. And it's, it basically says, what's there? Best of luck. And may the ball ro uh, roll kindly for you, which is what I've always based my football philosophy on. If you get a lucky bounce and the ball goes for you, you'll score a goal. If you get a bad bounce, you obviously miss it or uh, you could be injured in for that. So to me, this is, was all what my football philosophy is based on and it emphasises the luck that you actually do need to do well in professional football. Well, over here we have uh, other mementos and trophies that I've actually won. Uh, the medals that I, I have won, or so to speak, have lost two Scottish Cup final runners up. Uh, that's a reserve cup winners medal and a Coca-Cola cup runners up again. Um, it's been nice to, to get to finals, but also I prefer them to have been winners medals, but that's the way it's been for me so far. Hopefully we can change that. These here are um, a bit different. I was lucky enough to be honoured by uh, the council at the city chambers, Eric Milligan, the, the Lord Provost, a, a big hearts man. The biggest honour he can bestow on anybody is to present them with the, the cufflinks of the city. And I was really touched that he, he had a little reception for me and, and present me these. As I say, they're, they're only given to Lord and Lady Provost to wear, so it's a, a very big honour. It may not mean a lot to other people, but obviously being an Edinburgh lad, uh, it really does mean a lot to me. And I'll, I'll treasure these, um, obviously, for all time. I presented them to John Robertson because John Robertson's feet and the number of goals that he has scored for Harps isn't just a remarkable number of goals. Uh, that allows the heart supporters of today to celebrate John Robertson. I actually think the number of goals that John has scored entitles heart supporters and others to come to the view that he has actually been the greatest goal scorer ever in the heart's history. John's got an uncanny ability to read the game. When the ball ricochets in the goal mouth, it always seems to ricochet in John Robertson's direction. And people often say, oh, an awful lot of these goals, he's just rolled them into the net because he's been lucky to be at the right spot at the right time. But in truth, of course, it's because he's a very intelligent player, it's because he follows the game, and he knows 
where the ball is likely to land. And that shows that he is a lot more than just a good striker of the ball. He's a good reader of the game. At the start of season 1996-97, the one record which John had been striving for, Jimmy Wardhaw's, was now becoming a real possibility. However, the Hearts team were hungry for silverware, and that too seemed possible when they reached the quarter-final of the Coca-Cola Cup to take on Celtic. And Hoydong. Salvatore! Wasn't far away. That's good play from McNamara. And Hoydong, difficult angle, but he very nearly made something of it. So Andy Thorne takes the free kick. Yes, it is Andy Thorne of Wimbledon playing for Hearts tonight. Who have just joined us. Chance for Robertson, almost a second bite at it. They impose their quality on this quarter final. Van Hoydong. Naismith. Gary Mackay for 10 man hearts. Cameron! Manus takes. Despite being reduced to 10 men after Stefano Salvatore was ordered off, Hearts had survived for 90 minutes. In the interval time, Hearts fans were willing John on to help his team to qualify in his own unique way. Well, Celtic, when the draw was made, this was a tricky tie. For them, make no mistake about it. Away in Edinburgh, all the fashion of Tyne Castle. That brilliant strike with only 10 minutes to go ensured a place in the semis, where Hearts overcame Dundee by three goals to one. It meant that Hearts would meet league champions Rangers in the final. The game would show that despite being two goals behind in the early stages, Hearts' fighting spirit would ensure that they would not lie down. There's a good by Keelan, here's Mackay. Great ball in, Pye wandering square. Corner kick's given. There for Hearts. Cameron playing it in for Fulton. Great goal by Fulton! The Coca Cola Cup final has come alive! The way we knew was playing it around. We knew just to get it out of him and the way the game was going, especially when we scored the second goal, we felt as if we could do it. No, because I'm sure a lot of people. Maybe there's a wee doubt in our own minds, like when it went to 2-0, but like, I'm not going to get it back, especially the way the Scottish Cup final had went. Well, I thought when the, the goal went in, we were definitely the better side and we were going to go on to win, but Europe was never far away, and, and some say we should have got a foul, actually, just before Gascoigne scored, and then it was on Weerobo. But the feeling when, uh, when Weerobo scored from across was absolutely brilliant, the sheer ovation. Well, intercepted by Richie. Despite that fight back, Rangers scored two late goals to Paul Gascoigne. Again, Hearts had tasted disappointment. I must admit, 2-2, I thought we had a real chance of winning the trophy. And the five minutes after that as well, 
we were well on top. Uh, we had Rangers on the back foot. But then Paul Gascoigne, you know, that's why Rangers paid 4.3 million or something for him. He showed two or three minutes of sheer magic, two fabulous goals, and Rangers were in command again. But when you consider we lost 5-1 in the previous final, to go back and go 2-0 down quite early and fight back and, and give as good as we got over a piece, you just got to keep going. You just keep knocking at the door because sooner or later it's going to open up. November one was the worst because we came back in the second half. When John scored the equaliser, we both thought that was it. We had earned our right to this cup till Paul Gascoigne done it to us again. Um, that was heartbreaking. And then you face each other after the game, the wives feel as bad as the players, and you all try to put a brave face on it for each other, and it's, it's horrendous. Um, and then you put a brave face on it for the supporters, and they're always absolutely brilliant anyway, the heart support, they've been great. And we thought that was his last chance at, you know, a, a cup medal, because that's the one thing he hasn't got that he would truly love to get. That's his ambition now. The Coca-Cola Cup final disappointments have made John even more determined to break the league scoring record, not only for himself, but for the legions of Loyal Hearts supporters. I pride myself on consistency. I've, I've not done 14, 15, 16 goals a season over the last six or seven years. I had a good run just around about Christmas, as I said, nine, ten goals in seven or eight games, which obviously boosts the, the, uh, the tally up. But I don't know, I just, you know, put the ball in the net, I went away, perhaps the fact that as a, as a kid went at the club, the contract was up again and needed to, to try and find a new one. So they always say that I'll, I'll do well in the last year of my contract, and there might be a bit of truth in that. That's a good ball! Yes! John Robertson! John reached yet another milestone when he scored his 200th league goal against Dunfermline on Boxing Day. The New Year derby was a crucial one for Hearts. Hibs had a new manager in the form of Jim Duffy and were clearly optimistic about their new regime. We knew going into that game that uh, Hibs would be fired up. They were fired up. Um, the crowd got the change at management level they'd be looking for, so they were going to get right behind them. The Hibs players uh, would then feel the benefit of the, of the crowd getting behind them. The fact that they, they, you know, they were kicking downhill in the first half, we knew they'd come at us, and I thought Hibs played very, very well for, for 20 minutes. To be fair, Jim Jeffries must take most of the credit here, because he got us down there, he got us down a wee bit earlier than normal, got the team settled down and said, look, you know, Hibs fans, if, it, you know, if, if, if Jim Duffy had, had just been appointed the manager, and he felt if Jockey Scott had still been in charge, that we, we could have won the game um, quite comfortably. But he felt with Jim Duffy being there that the Hibs fans were going to be up for it. It's a new manager, we're going to give him a big reception. It's a new year, it's, you know, it's a new start for them type thing. And he felt that Hibs were going to be really up for it. And he was demanding extra concentration, extra work rate, extra everything for this game because he knew how badly Hibs wanted a victory. John popped up at the right time. And, uh, you know, that's what he's been good at against Hibs over the past. And great record against him. He stuck one away and from there, Hibs completely took over. Was when John was able to score what was a typical uh, Robertson goal just about 10, 15 minutes before the interval to really put Hibbs into um, serious problems. And as everyone knows, we went on to win that game 4 0. So that was a most important goal and a great way to start the year. And um, well, as we know, Hibbs um, just scraped through that's the end of that season. And uh, I, I rather think that game probably. Um, helped them to get into the position that they eventually found themselves in.
In January, John was within one goal of equaling Wardhaw's record, but at that crucial time, he suffered an injury which threatened to thwart his goal. An added pressure with only three games to go was that John's contract was due for renewal at the end of the season. Time was rapidly running out. I picked up a groin injury originally and I missed two or three matches. Came back for one and aggravated it again and missed another two or three games. And by that time, you know, suddenly with having 11 league games to beat the record, I only had four and five. And then I picked up a niggling knee injury that required surgery. And all of a sudden it was down to the last four games. And it was really, really frustrating at that time because the fans were willing to want to do it. Um, they wanted it done before the end of the season. The, the season was not petering out because we were still chasing a European slot with Dundee United, but they wanted it done and the, the games were running out thick and fast. And uh, I must admit, I wasn't the easiest person to live with at that time. Here's Cameron. Robertson making a run inside him. That's a good pass. Here's Robertson. The first touch let him down. Back with an excellent chance by top-level standards and one which John Robertson would expect to do much better with. Because the harder I was trying, the worse it gets. And although there are, as uh, I mentioned earlier, runs in the league where you score goals and can't miss, there's also the droughts that go with it, four, five, six games. And that was exactly what was in it at that moment in time. I, I didn't think I was going to get there. After weeks of waiting, the opportunity finally came against Unfermline in the third last game of the season. He was nervous, thought he was going to get a new contract with the Hearts, so his chance of beating the record was slipping away. He was a bit difficult to live with, I would say. Well, there was a great head about for Jim Hamilton. And Kevin Thomas actually got there first, he headed it and I had a swing in my boot. And I just clipped off my boot on the way in. And to be fair, the ball hit me rather than me hitting the ball, to be perfectly truthful. But I knew I had the touch and I wasn't hanging about to dispute it. It was the first time I managed to pull off a surprise party that he thought it would be the following week, but he didn't expect it that night. He came round the corner with Neil Point and then Big Davey and thought it was my neighbour that was having the party with a 17-foot banner across the front of the house. Um, a forum that John's friend had done in the red carpet and some of the dice playing in the background and Gary Mackay's dad doing a wee speech to him and as many of the old Hearts team as we could get that could manage were there. John equaled Jimmy Wardhall's record of 206 goals against Dunfermline but drew a blank the next week against Dundee United. His final chance came against Rangers in the last match of the season. And in recognition of equaling the record, a presentation was made to John before the game. It, it meant a lot. Um, there was three presentations, and obviously the first one came from my family um, and Tracy's family. They decided that to mark uh, the equaling the record that they were going to present me with a beautiful crystal ball that my father-in-law got made for me. Um, I was very touched for that because, you know, sometimes you take your family for granted, and you think, you know, they're just watching the games, but they were really chuffed, so to speak, with my achievement as well. And then also I got a beautiful uh, vase from the club to mark it, because they were willing on. I think that I think it was dusty by the time I got it. They'd had it for a few weeks. Um, but I was delighted, you know, that that was there. And the fact that on the day that Rangers, you know, they saw it fitting to give our award as well, which again shows you that other people notice things that go on. I, I was really touched the fact that Rangers took time out uh, to honour me as well, and as I say, it was it was a great start to the game, and that really sort of got me going with the hope that I could go out against Rangers and uh, try and get the final goal to to break the record. And obviously, my chances were boosted when Walter told me that half his team were still recovering from the hangover. So I thought this might be the day. I knew that this was a moment that everybody was waiting on. And I, I put the ball on the spot and I decided myself that I was just going to hammer it down the middle. But then I heard Paul Gascoigne and, and Ian Durant shouting to go just to stand still. So that kind of blew that route out, so I just decided to head down and hit it into the corner. I knew what it meant, everybody knew what it meant. I was just the, the relief burst 
And then the satisfaction sort of came in as I was going back to half and thinking, yeah, great, that's all been done with. It was brilliant for everybody concerned with the club. I mean, Jimmy Wardog was a legend here, and it just shows you how, how much a legend Robo is now that he's broke the record. I mean, I don't think there'll be any player who will equal his record. I was elated for him. He's friends with somebody for a number of years, and you can feel the pressure getting to them. And once they get over that barrier, they're just elated. They did happen to buy my bottle of champagne later on. <laughs> If John's first goal was memorable as the record breaker, his second will be long remembered for proving his sheer football ability and style. John Robertson again, persistence, chance to run at Jochen Bjorklund. He's inside of Robertson. This is a chance for a goal, Robertson! It's a great goal by John Robertson! He's not only broke the record, he smashed it! Typical strikers, you've not scored for a couple of games. You get a goal and then all of a sudden you can't miss. And you know, I went in a wee bit of amazing and put the second goal away, which I don't think anybody's ever seen John Robertson run so far with the ball. Strikers, I think. 